Hi everyone, welcome to today's class which is in continuation of the chapter locomotion and movement. In the previous classes we have learnt about muscle and its contraction and today we would be discussing the skeletal system and the human skeletal system in particular. So let us begin with skeletal system. So the first question arises that what is the need for the skeletal system? So the first need of course is that the muscles when they produce movement they require a rigid support against which they can contract. So that is why a skeletal system is required to which the muscles can attach and develop the force of contraction. Now in the entire animal kingdom we will find that the skeletal system can be categorized into three types. One is the hydroskeleton like as we see in case of annelids for example earthworm. Now in earthworm there is no rigid structure rather within the body a fluid is filled and that fluid is providing the shape to the body and that is why the term hydroskeleton for it is used. And you can imagine this something like a long balloon filled with water. So if one side we contract it the other side will then just broaden. So in this manner the animal is able to move but very refined movement won't be possible in such a case. And here volume of the fluid within the body remains constant even if compression is applied over it. Now another type of a skeletal system that arose that was exoskeleton that was with arthropods where it is a rigid skeleton of chitin and it is outside the body. So here the muscles are attached to this exoskeleton from the inner side of it and they contract against that support. And among arthropods insects being the biggest group we know that they even are able to fly and of course they are found in other habitats where they are swimming as well as walking and flying running all of these activities are possible. Then when we come to vertebrates the muscles are attached to an internal scaffold of bones and cartilage and this is the endoskeleton. It is both rigid and wherever cartilage is present that provides sufficient flexibility. Then between the two bones there is joints which again provides the flexibility and this is able to bear far more weight than chitin and that is the reason the vertebrates have been able to acquire such large sizes like elephant whales uh, which you can never ever imagine for an insect. So from here moving on to the human skeletal system. In human beings the skeletal system is made up of 206 bones and a few cartilages. So here our magic number is 206 and it is grouped into two principal divisions that is the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. Now I will introduce Petit Pete to you and let us see what this axial and appendicular skeleton is. So here is Petit Pete and so this little guy you can see the entire skeletal system here and in this case the part of the skeletal system which is along the midline along the axis of the body that is the skull here the vertebral column the rib cage this is making up our axial skeleton and the limbs and the limbs are attached to the girdles this one is the appendicular skeleton coming from the word appendages so the fore limbs and hind limbs are the appendages. So now from this axial and appendicular skeleton we will discuss all the different bones which are present. So starting with the skull. So now Petit can go back. So first of all the various bones which are present in the axial skeleton and those are 80 bones in all out of which skull is made up of 22 bones which can be categorized into two cranium that is the brain box having 8 bones and the facial bones which are 14 in number and ear ossicles these are 3 in each of the middle ear so the total is 6 hoid this is our tongue bone which is 1 vertebral column is having 26 bones in it the sternum is having 1 bone and the ribs are 12 pairs so that makes the total of 24 and we add up all these bones so it is 80 so axial skeleton 
out of 206 bones in the entire skeleton is 80 bones being constituting it. So, starting with the skull first of all. So, here if we see the skull in the side view, this is how it will appear and in which we can see many of the bones, but not all of course. And this is the front view of the skull. So, first of all, let us take the various functions of the skull. So, here the most important function is of course to protect the brain and that is of course done by the cranium or the brain box. Then the skull bears the jaws which help the animal in cutting and masticating the food. Ear ossicles they help in the amplification of sound so that the sound waves can move from outside to the internal ear and it protects and supports the special sense organs that is the internal ear the olfactory membrane and the eyes these are also protected by the skull. Now in the cranium if we describe the various bones so in the cranium we have eight bones in total and out of this eight bones let us take them one by one starting with frontal. Now frontal is the one which is making our forehead the front part and also the upper part of the eye orbit and this one is a single bone unpaired bone. Now another one parietal. So, this is making up the upper part of the side of the cranium and these are paired bones. So, that would be two bones and major part of the roof of the cranial cavity is formed by this parietals. Temporal. Now, temporal are here. So, inferior lateral aspect of the cranium and part of the cranial floor and within it the internal ear is also protected and this bone is also a paired bone on both sides left and right side it will be present. So, this is a paired bone. Next one occipital. Now, occipital is a single bone and here you can see it is almost forming the base of the cranium and in this base there is a large aperture that is called foramen magnum and it is this foramen magnum through which the spinal cord will be joining with the medulla oblongata and in this occipital bone there is also a condyle. Condyle means a small protuberance by which it will articulate with the vertebral column. So, in the vertebral column the first vertebra is called atlas. So, with atlas the occipital bone will make a joint and on that joint we can move our head especially when we are trying to nod our head to say yes. So, this condyle are two of them and because of that human skull or mammalian skull can be said to be dicondylic. Dicondylic because there are two occipital condyles. Then another one sphenoid. Now sphenoid is this one here. This is a single bone but quite a large one because its extension we will be seeing on the other side as well and if we take out this bone it is almost in the shape of a butterfly and it is also called the keystone bone because it articulates with all the cranial bones and within it if we dismantle it we will be able to see it within it there is a saddle shaped structure again very important and that is called the cella tersica and here the pituitary gland is located so that it is protected within this small Turkish saddle. Among the cranial bones last but not the least that is ethmoid. Now ethmoid again is a single bone and it is sponge like in appearance. It is also forming a side of the eye orbit and also the floor of the cranium and where it makes the floor of the cranium at that location it is like a sponge cribri form plate because there are number of apertures in it through which the branches of the olfactory nerve pass to the brain. So, in the cranial bones out of the eight bones two of them are paired that is temporal and parietal and rest of them are the unpaired bones. Now, moving on to the facial bones which are making up the face. So, here we have the nasal bones 
these are paired forming the bridge of the nose next one inferior nasal conchi or infra nasals this is also paired bone and here it is forming the inferior nasal conchi which we know are called the turbinates which we have also studied with the respiratory system and so these will be inside the wall of the nasal cavity next one lacrimals lacrimals are the smallest of the facial bones paired bones and this is on the side here of the eye orbit and it is enclosing the lacrimal sac that is the tear sac then coming on to vomer vomer is forming part of the nasal septum so nasal septum the inferior part that means which is backward in the front the nasal septum that we have that is made up of hyaline cartilage and this one is a single bone this is unpaired next one palatine palatine of course we cannot see it from the front but this is a paired bone and it is forming the posterior part of the hard palate so in the buccal cavity we know that the upper part that is the hard palate that is comprising palatine and in the front part it will be the maxilla and it is also you can say forming the floor of the nasal cavity or the roof of the buccal cavity that would be one and the same thing then next one zygomatic now zygomatic again paired bones these are also called the cheek bones so the prominence of the cheek that we see that is actually the zygomatics then coming to maxilla and mandible that is the upper jaw and the lower jaw now out of this maxilla of course is paired but mandible is a single bone unpaired one and these have sockets for teeth and out of the entire skull the only movable bone is the mandible now there are two more structures which are present in the skull but they are not directly counted as the skull bones and those are hoid and the ear ossicles so coming on to hoid it is also called the tongue bone it's a single bone u shaped and it is between lower jaw and the larynx it is suspended from the temporal bones by means of ligaments and it supports the tongue and also provides the site for the attachment of tongue muscles that is the reason it is called tongue bone and finally the ear ossicles which are six in number total three in each middle ear and these are named as malleus which is hammer shaped incus which is anvil shaped and stapes which is stirrup shaped and these ossicles are not providing any framework or support to the body rather their function is the conduction of sound waves from the external ear to the internal ear and out of these stapes is also the smallest bone of the body so this much was regarding the skull and some associated bones now next let us talk about the vertebral column